And I think I turned my cell phone off, uh, but you should also remember to do that. Uh, thanks for coming. Oh, Carol, you want to? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm, whoops, I don't think we're ready for that yet. Did somebody step on the, <laughs> the lights? Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm Lila Abulorad, and I'm the director for the uh, Center for the Study of Social Difference and also the director of the Middle East Institute. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you to this uh, very special evening. And we're here to honor the creativity, the vision, and the impact of Mira Nair, who's an extraordinary filmmaker on the global scene. And uh, we're going to have a chance to engage with her about her work. And although she lives in the neighborhood uh, and has a close association with Columbia, including the School of the Arts, uh, we rarely have the opportunity to, uh, with her busy schedule, to have her speak with us. Um, so before I uh, say something about her uh, and talk about the program, I just wanted to thank a few important people who made this evening possible, and actually I see a lot more people I should thank, but forgive me. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, terrific partnership that we developed with GSEP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation and Planning, in whose uh, lovely auditorium we're sitting, and it's been a delight to work with them. And we are really grateful for their eager and totally competent uh, co-sponsorship of the event. And Dean Mark Wiggly uh, was enthusiastic uh, about this event from the minute that uh, Women Creating Change proposed it, and Gavin Browning back there, and uh, made it integral to their calendar uh, with media help from Paul Dallas. So hopefully that will all go well. Um, and it's a tribute, I think, to the admiration so many people have for Mira Nair that anyone who heard about the idea of inviting her and honoring her, uh, featuring her as a woman creating change, wanted to be part of this. Um, and so we had to turn people away, but only the Heyman Center, uh, and Eileen Bluley's here, uh, the School of the Arts, and Carol Becker, Dean Carol Becker is here, the South Asia Institute, and I think Bill Carrick, Akil, uh, is away, and the Middle East Institute got the baraka, as we say, the blessing of being able to co-sponsor uh, uh, this event. So thank you everyone for uh, everything you did, uh, including Daisy um, from the School of the Arts, and to all the students and staff who are helping with the logistics, um, and uh, also all the alumni. Um, now, uh, um, Women, I just want to talk a little bit about Women Creating Change, uh, which is a project, project of the Center for the Study of Social Difference. Uh, and that's an advanced study center that was created, I couldn't even remember, maybe about five years ago uh, here uh, to facilitate international research and collaborations uh, and exchange among, uh, of ideas among scholars and others trying to understand and address social inequalities. The project was launched, uh, Women Creating Change, in direct response to the opportunities for internationalizing uh, knowledge that Columbia's global centers have opened up for many of us. And with the intellectual leadership of Jean Howard and Marianne Hirsch, um, and perfect support from Laura Chalkowski, uh, our associate director, uh, we launched. And our commitment in this project is to understanding how contemporary global problems affect women, and how feminist scholars, activists, artists, and practitioners in a variety of fields are creatively addressing these uh, problems. And we work collaboratively and internationally building uh, networks of exchange, dialogue, expertise around pressing problems. Uh, deep regional roots are at the heart of what we do, and a better future is a key to our hopes. Um, and I can give you a sense of the initiative by talking about a couple of the working groups, uh, and I'll talk about another one later. But as we speak, although they may be asleep now with the time difference, uh, and if Taksim Square is not up in flames, there's a working group called uh, Rethinking Vulnerability and Resistance, led by the renowned philosopher Judith Butler, that's convening in Istanbul uh, right now. Uh, and they're trying to think through the potentials and the pitfalls of using claims to women's special vulnerability as a strategy for justice. 
An interdisciplinary group, uh, working group on mobilizing memory is just forming and will be meeting in Colombia's uh, Global Center in Santiago with its partners from Latin America in January. And they're exploring the creative ways that women's groups have been managing the aftermath of political violence and dictator dictatorships uh, and around questions of memories. And um, what we think a world-class university can offer is space for what we like to call slow thought, and I suppose that's somewhat insulting, but we don't mean it that way, uh, on the model of slow food. Uh, our initiative is about creating the conditions in which scholars, students, artists, uh, activists, policy makers can carefully prepare research, can do fresh thinking together, and can savor the complexity of what we must do and understand if we hope to address social problems responsibly. So uh, we've had a tremendous support for these efforts by, um, from President Bollinger, and we're very happy that uh, Jean Maniano Bollinger is here with us this evening, herself an artist. Um, and this is the second public ev event highlighting the ideals of this initiative, and she was there at the first one. Um, and Kaplan isn't here yet. She's on her way, uh, and I just want to say something about her uh, because she's been so important to us. She's a Columbia trust, uh, cl trustee and distinguished alumna who chairs the board's subcommittee on global initiatives. Uh, and she's been a great champion of women creating change uh, in this initiative. Uh, and uh, on her behalf, uh, I think I welcome all the Columbia alumni who are here and invite them to find out more about how to be part of this initiative. But now, finally, but we, we have to do that and it's a nice thing. But of course what you're waiting for is um, to hear about Mira Nair and actually to hear from her. But I have to say a few things about her. You're here because you know who she is, because you admire her as I do, but I still want to talk. Uh, and say indeed that she is a woman creating change and one of the most global citizens that I know. Deeply at home in New York, in Delhi, in Bombay, in Kampala. Uh, she immerses herself in locations uh, throughout the world, making films about the movements of people across borders, their displacements, their attachments, uh, their losses, and their dreams. Uh, and I think she does embody a search for a better future for our world. Uh, no more um, than in her latest film, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, which we're going to glimpse part of tonight. The facts, of course, are impressive. You probably know them. She's made 11 feature films, many documentaries. Um, most of her films have been nominated for or won uh, major coveted awards. She's had the Golden Camera at Cannes, the Golden Lion at Venice. I'm sorry to embarrass you, Mira. Um, and she was recently given the Padma Bhushan Award by the Indian government. So uh, multinational awards. And I think she's a totally distinctive voice in, film, in the film world. She tackles sensitive issues, blending the personal and political as uh, I think no one else. Her touch as an artist is special. Uh, others of you know more about that than I do. Uh, I think you know, the exuberance of the music, the saturation of the color, the boldness of the personalities, uh, the resilience of big human beings uh, with torn emotions, picking themselves up after they fall, searching uh, in life. But it's her s social vision that marks uh, her best, I think, for many of us who are not uh, in the film world. Uh, and she's deep, she's ethical, and she's courageous. Uh, from the street children and prostitutes of Salem Bombay to interracial love, prejudice, and political exclusion of nativism and nationalism in Mississippi Masala, she makes us feel the injustices of the world. Uh, from monsoon wedding to the namesake, she takes us into the knots of power in the family, uh, exploring the experiences of arranged marriage, forbidden sexual passions, and taboos uh, like child sexual abuse. And she shows the poignancy, the loneliness, the hope, and the generational ruptures of people who move across worlds. Now what's rare for me, um, because of what I work on, is that she never asks us to pity anyone. Seeing the creativity of even the most dispossessed, the most abject. And in, in India Cabaret, for example, her 1985 documentary about dancers in a tawdry strip club in Mumbai, she didn't sensationalize 
or ask the West to come in and rescue these poor women despite the stigma and the exploitation that they describe in the film. Instead, she shows them as these remarkable women uh, seeking and seizing what they can from the world while also shocking us into recognizing that the respectability of good women is just as much of a prison. And her perspective um, is always at an angle uh, to the standard American or European uh, perspective. She turned Vanity Fair into a story about empire, uh, carrying through uh, just what Edward Said, uh, the 10th anniversary of whose passing we're marking through a series of events here at Columbia beginning next Monday at, on uh, September 23rd, what he wrote about in his book, Culture and Imperialism. For him, I think she would surely represent the best of a new vision. Someone who treats East and West as intimately connected, not separate, and who holds up a mirror to the West rather than looking out from it. And welcome, Anne Kaplan, we already <laughs> introduced you, thank you. Uh, so there's a lot more to say, uh, but I just wanted to end with one note about Mira Nair's generosity in the world. Um, she taught at the film school at Columbia when she first returned to New York from South Africa then. Uh, she was in the first group of Rolex mentors for young artists and mentored a young Thai filmmaker. Uh, she founded and runs Maisha, a unique film training lab for promising artists from East Africa, pairing them with mentors who can help them develop the tools, as uh, they say, to tell their stories through film. Uh, very important, and to develop the film industry in East Africa. Uh, she's also made films about AIDS. She founded a trust for uh, street children. The list goes on. This is a person in the world and generous to the world. Now when, um, GSAP, uh, Graduate School of Architecture Planning and what is it? <laughs> Preservation and Planning. And then I thought PP, which order? Uh, when they asked um, uh, to fit with the theme of their program uh, this semester and some of the posters are uh, around hanging up, they asked what kind of work or occupation besides film directing her main thing, she imagined herself as doing, or liked to think of herself as doing, as a kind of alter ego, she suggested two possibilities. One was aspiring yogi, uh, and, um, but then she also suggested gardener, which is, I think, just right, and that's what they put on the poster, uh, and she has, in fact, created an incredible lush garden in her uh, home in Uganda, but she's also cultivating a global garden for humanity, and I think the global landscape uh, suggests that that's the case, a place where we can live uh, better. So um, the program is, uh, uh, and we have a nice additional surprise, uh, we're going to show uh, a new three-minute clip that is a kind of montage of some of her older films. Uh, then she's going to uh, say a few words about the next two clips that we will show. One from a film called The Global Landscape, uh, that's a documentary about the making of The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And then we'll show the first uh, 13 minutes, uh, the opening uh, part of The Reluctant Fundamentalist. For those of you who uh, have seen it, it'll bring back memories. For those of you who haven't, you'll want to go see it after uh, we do that. So we'll do the first. Um, three minute clip, uh, and then Mira will talk, thanks. Does this go off like that?
man born and raised in Mississippi ain't a damn thing you can tell me about struggle. What do you know about my... No, I know. I know. I know that you and your daughter ain't but a few shades from this right here. That I know. Thank you so much. That was very beautiful. It wasn't slow thought what I was hearing. Um, but thank you so much for this invitation and for this honor to be here. I uh, have. Okay, guys! <laughs> I've lived in the neighborhood for more than almost 30 years. Uh, moved here after graduation, 119th in Amsterdam, and I used to sit in on Columbia Film, Univer Film School courses without them knowing for about two years. <laughs> so I really appreciate your inviting me legally <laughs> to the university. <laughs> it's really true. Um, um, I know that my uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, professors who are going to speak with me have done a lot of homework and I don't want to take too much time but I just wanted to say briefly that what you're going to see uh, is a, a sort of amazing documentary that I almost didn't know was happening. She was everywhere at the same time. A wonderful videographer called Marion Lacombe who followed me and my team as we made The Reluctant Fundamentalist, a film that uh, without exaggeration, probably was the most difficult one I have made because no one wanted to finance it. But uh, uh, Marion came with us through the four continents in which we shot the film. And it's not your usual, uh, what we call in the business, EPK, e electronic press kit. I think it's much better than that. But I have not seen it, to be honest, for a while. But it uh, shows you some of the trials and tribulations of making a film that um, doesn't give you the right answers and shows you a side of the world and, a, and an opinion of the world that 
when many people fight hard for not being made or not it should not exist so it's an interesting i think and fair uh, dialogue between worlds that have uh, continue to misunderstand each other to the point of great violence. Um, anyway, so see this film for, I think it's about 10 minutes or so, you'll see it. And then um, we can show the beginning of The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Uh, uh, and then we are here. I'm happy to talk with you about anything you might be interested in. Thank you so much. fashioned as a thriller, really. Uh, it is hopefully a page-turning kind of thriller, where two men meet, have a conversation. The kidnapping of an American citizen. If another man has been kidnapped, a clock is ticking, and you don't know what is going to happen, who will live and who will die. That is the tale, it's almost like Sherzad's tale. That is the tale that both these men spin for each other. And as they spin this tale, we go off and we see this life of the young man as he has gone to New York and Princeton and the highest echelons of Western society. Uh, so it's a movie that takes place in two times, in 2001 and 2011. The pace and rhythm of the film is really a thriller, uh, but you know, I'm a person who is full of appetite for life and beauty and fun and fashion. And so in my films, you, you get taken on that ride as well. I kind of stalked this project. As soon as I read the book, I was like, I love this book. Oh my God, this has to be a film. I found out the publisher. I was like, can I have the film rights? I said, go away. Forgot about it, was broken hearted. Then realized there was a film being made. Couldn't really get an audition for it. I hadn't really done many romantic roles. So she was like, I don't know, I need a romantic lead. I was actually not going to be able to do the movie because I got pregnant. I had just had the baby eight weeks before I started shooting. And I just said, absolutely, you know, and, and, and I was uh, breastfeeding the whole time. And every three hours I was, you know, we'd breastfeed and Mira would rub my feet and they'd be changing, changing the setups. It was definitely an emotional experience like right now. When I okay. Come on, guys, let's make a movie here. Yeah. Mira used this in, in extremely sensitive political backdrop to tell a story about how to connect. We had a really intimate set, which was nice because it felt like a different story within her big tapestry. You look so serious. Oh my God. What? I couldn't find the combination I needed of a authentic 
Pakistani young man who speaks Urdu colloquially, who dreams in English, who can be as elegant in a Wall Street corporate party as he is bedding Kate Hudson, as he is with his family in Lahore and knowing poems. It took me a year and a half to find Riz Ahmed. I made him read a scene where he both shames his father and is afflicted by remorse. Look at your mother's handiwork. She had some assistance. What do you mean? I mean that this job of mine you don't see the point of actually helped to create this celebration, all right? And Riz just got it, you know, instantly. He understood the idea of izzat, what we call izzat, which is honor and shame, so beautifully and deeply. And I just immediately knew I had found Chingiz. A lot of the film is about him trying to find his identity um, because he's coming from a family of, of artists and poets. And that's why Wall Street for him in a weird way is a kind of re rebellion. Uh, I play Jim Cross, who is the managing director of a very high-end boutique hedge fund. And I hire uh, Riz's character named Chungus. How do you squeeze more productivity out of a company that pays its workers five bucks a day. They would find out that a broken company is actually more valuable than a functioning company and that they take it apart and sell it. It's almost like stealing a car. And the car's value is actually greater by the sum of its parts than as a working machine. I say, let's get a team in from Japan and, and fix the line. Then this entire crew becomes completely superfluous. We have a gift for this. A very lucrative gift. Consider this a down payment. You're a long way from Lahore, kid. Let's see. And then the terrible events of 9-11 occur and his life changes. And it is a story about how through our own fear, uh, and, and I guess ignorance on some level, uh, that we have taken, in some cases, our greatest allies uh, and turn them into our enemies. And that is what the film is about to me. The hero of our story, Chengiz, is a rising star in Wall Street. And he returns to a home, Pakistan, which is now burning with all kinds of religious and extremism. And the reluctant fundamentalist in our title is both the reluctance to be a fundamentalist economically and certainly religiously. The beard? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it, it represents, uh, you know, his evolution as a character, um, as, a, as a young man, he kind of, he goes through certain changes and um, he, he takes on certain aspects of his culture, so in that sense it's, uh, it is relevant, but uh, hopefully there's more to the character than the beard. There can be laziness behind growing a beard. There can be a kind of national identification behind growing a beard. There can be a kind of anti-corporatist sentiment. And there can be sort of religious motivations behind growing a beard. And we can never know when you see a beard which of those things is at play. And uh, in Chinggis's case, you know, some, all, uh, several uh, of those might be going on. But, um, uh, but it, becomes, it becomes a market. I'm playing a Turkish publisher in Istanbul. The publisher has been publishing books for 40 years from the Middle East, from the writers of the Middle East. And Cengiz meets me, and that meeting changes the course of his life. It's a book of poems by Fez Ahmed Fez, one of the greatest poets in Urdu, probably the 20th century. It's about social justice, it's about freedom, and also about timeless themes like love. Go! on my favorite street in New Delhi, and we are in the family home of the movie, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. You could be in Lahore right now. So welcome to both the real family, the film family, and also to hear Shabana sing Bol yeah. is kind of extraordinary because Bol has become, of course, our anthem for this film. Most of Fez Saab's work is the anthem for this film. 
And Ami says he doesn't want he doesn't want to sing a Jew. He's an American now. He's an American now. Uh, so then Abu says uh, he's mute, mute, but he's not deaf. So you listen. It is a short poem that exhorts the people to speak. It's called Bol. Bol means speak, and it's really about giving strength to people to be able to speak, to be able to protest, to speak the truth as they know it. And the poet says, this little time that you have to speak the truth, speak without fear. Okay, so we have uh, always uh, Uf Hume, yeah. always Abu. Yeah. Why does the power go out, uh, go out in the middle of my program? Uf Hume. I play the role of Bina, who is Chinggis's sister. This is uh, my character in the movie. Plays a character on television. It was act- an actual show on Pakistani television. It was very, very popular and very funny. And this, in the movie, we're doing a spoof of a sitcom that was a spoof to begin with. As somebody who has been born and bred in Lahore, I can I can definitely say that it's real life, everyday life is very different from watching uh, footage on the media, for example. You never think Pakistan, the, the land of drones and beheadings and assassinations, could ever be a place where there's great Bonhomi, great family ties, extraordinary music, extraordinary painting. So I feel that this film, in showing both worlds with equal intimacy and actually equal love, um, will create a dialogue, will create a conversation. the Anglo-Islamic school. It's in the middle of, well, it's just on the edge of Old Delhi uh, by Ajmeri Gate. And it's a, uh, an old uh, Mughal estate dating back to the late 1500s. Uh, and we have built a, a set along one edge of it to create our Anarchy Bazaar, which uh, supposed to be in Lahore in Pakistan. The guy you were shooting, whacking, was he whacking the flies on the dates? So the kind of flies just kind of get ground into the dates. Like chocolate covered ants. He was very diligent in his work. It was a tip from the prop master who uh, shot here on Gandhi. And uh, we were looking for, I was looking for a a campus uh, and had exhausted all the, most of the possibilities and was asking him if he knew of any old university campus, was there an old university campus here? And the school continues through the shooting? Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they do. It's interesting actually being here because I just found out the other week that my, my granddad's uncle used to be the president of this college that we're filming at today. And apparently this was the college, the Anglo-Arabic college that was it's quite a, an amazing history. It was the first uh, college to teach Western science in Delhi. Um, it was also involved in the Aligarh movement and was instrumental in helping you know, in the creation of Pakistan as well. So I had quite an illustrious career, but I, I had no idea about it until you know, last week. And here we are. So I guess right now I have a kind of sense of reconnecting to my own heritage as well, being here filming. Samir is their teaching assistant, he is a professor. Samir is saying that Gore has put a gun on the professor. So you are very angry, you come to their side. Then this will be the action that you have seen. So they need to just work it out so that the surge is, the silence is the surge. The surge, the silence is the surge.
off uh, so that we have time to talk. And uh, Mira's asked that maybe we save the uh, opening scenes of The Reluctant Fundamentalist till the end so that we could uh, have a chance to talk with you before that. Um, so we'll, we'll save that one for the end uh, and uh, open up just uh, to the panel so we get a chance to hear her talk more and uh, with, with our friends here. So um, I wanted to um, invite you, uh, Mabel, Anu, uh, and Mira up to the table. And what we're going to do um, is begin a conversation, and hopefully the lights will go on, uh, uh, a discussion with Mira uh, by Professors Anu Anupama Rao and Mabel Wilson. Anu uh, Rao is a professor of history, author of The Caste Question, uh, and Disciplines of the Body, as well as the senior editor of um, the Journal of Comparative Studies on Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East, uh, very appropriately. Uh, she also leads a project of, uh, with women creating change on subaltern urbanism, uh, bringing together architects, uh, creative artists, housing activists, and scholars to study how accelerated urbanization in the global south has affected the life worlds of the poor and disenfranchised. And the working group met in Mumbai last January, um, in fact, in GSAP's Studio X, right? Um, and uh, to discuss these issues, and they've been continuing uh, in various other ways um, since then. Mabel Wilson is the Nancy George and George Rupp Professor in GSAP and directs the Program for Advanced Architectural Research and co-directs the Global Africa Lab, and she works on American and African architecture and urbanization and is the author of a recent book called Negro Building, Black Americans and the World of Fairs and Museums. And she's also an award-winning architect. Um, and uh, like Anu, she's been involved uh, with, she's on the advisory board of the um, Women Creating Change, uh, but I think people know her best in this community uh, as uh, participating in one of the most vibrant and long-standing groups at CSSD, uh, one of the working groups on engendering the archive. So I want to thank them for joining us and they're just gonna open up the conversation with Mira and then we'll have time for other people to ask questions. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lila. Can I, I guess everybody can hear me, yes? Um, and so I'm honored and delighted, as I'm sure Anu is, um, uh, to be sitting here with one of the most skillful t storytellers. Your stories are absolutely amazing and enthralling. And also an inspiring film director of our time. I mean, you're an extraordinary talent, and, and um, I, I really admire the body of work that you've been able to cre uh, create. So thank you um, for sharing your work with us this evening. Um, and so I'm going to start into our, our first question, which is a kind of general question. And then I think Anno and I will start to talk a little bit more mm -hmm. with you about your various films. But, um, the theme that, that, that this extraordinary adventure, um, extraordinary initiative, um, is women creating change. And I think as Lila so eloquently captured, the spirit of this endeavor is to promote women working, as she said, collaboratively and internationally, um, building networks of exchange and expertise around pressing problems. Film making, because you make films, I always love the term filmmaking because it's so active. Um, as the documentary about the reluctant fundamentalists, I think, illustrates, is a collaborative practice between directors and uh, actors, various crews, camera folks, and, and whole communities, right? Um, so your practice, you also practice your craft within an industry that has very few women that have achieved your level of success. And, mm. and, and I always like to think of the film industry, and particularly women's involvement, as parallel to architecture. There are very few women in architecture as well, mm. because I think it command, you have to command an extraordinary amount of capital and resources and funding in order to practice the craft of what you make. Um, so can you share with us how your work as a director has helped us understand contemporary global prob problems and in particular how they impact the lives of women as a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. I know that's... <laughs> she wants it all. Um, well, you know, just growing up in a very small town in, in Bhubaneswar, in Orissa, where my father was a civil servant, that was the ridiculous but idealistic question, 
was can art create change in any way and what is art and those questions but can it create change because I lived with a mom who is, called herself a professional beggar and w went into action every time something happened like she was supposed to be a, a bureaucrat's wife in a stiff organza sari playing you know canasta but instead she had organized a hospital for the healthy children of leper parents, and leprosy was a big problem in Orissa. So I was surrounded in a small and daily way with activism. And I really, I really was inspired by you know, that, but I did not know how to achieve that or what to do with it. And I went through many little professions that I tested myself as a young person, you know, whether I'm a writer, whether I'm a journalist, whether I'm a painter, and fortunately I wasn't that. I'm still very interested in architecture and landscape uh, design, but I'm not there. And, and so I used to do these experiments, but it was only when I came to discover Cinema Verite documentary filmmaking, mm -hmm. uh, which was over here when I was 19 years old at MIT. Um, I, I stumbled upon a class that was taught by Ricky Leacock, who was uh, you know, the, kind of the founding, one of the founding members with Penny Baker of the handheld mobile camera mm -hmm. uh, movement. And that, I kind of found my groove at, by 1920, which is a real privilege because movie making is an obsessive act. It's a very difficult thing, and you have to learn to take the rejection early on, you know, and you have to sort of carve your way uh, if it's better earlier than later because it's it's hard nonetheless, you know. So, I came through documentary, and that was a way to really work with people because I love. I love that. My mother would say when I would go jogging at age 11, I would always return with the milkman because the milkman <laughs> stories were much more interesting than jogging around the block. So, uh, you know, in documentary film, I lived with strippers, I lived with people, I, I went uh, into the, a world that would never know, I would never know what would happen next. You know, and that was the power of it, you know, the, the, the power of everyday life. And, but then the frustration of who sees these films, mm -hmm. you know, and in the 80s it was pre-Bowling for Columbine, pre-documentary cinema mm -hmm. making it mm -hmm. to the wider world. And that's what prompted me to make a fiction film. But to which make a Salam Bombay. which is Salam Bombay, yeah. which was a real amalgam of working in the theater, because I worked in political theater in India uh, on the streets as an actor, mm -hmm. and working in uh, visually, with the, you know, in, in real locations, and working with real kids who had been through it and, and never thought for one second to cast a rich kid, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was the amalgam, and also to make it with finesse, to make the story with light and, and gesture and a certain kind of storytelling, not hit and run, you know. So, when Salam Bombay, I mean, worked in terms of even the profits of the film, we started this Trust for Street Kids, which is now 25 years old, and it's amazing. You know, 5,000 kids a year come through our trust. So that was the first great privilege, and it doesn't happen often, to actually create palpable change, you know, with the film, you know. So it is possible, but uh, I won't, it's not, it's not, uh, it's more about changing, I hope sometimes, a consciousness, uh, a way of, uh, a way of looking, a way of thinking about oneself and the world. but. Also, I hope it's fun. You know, I can't stand films that feel like homework. So when I, 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 I hope it's enter, you know entertaining in some unexpected way because the world is that way. You know, it's just that um, anyway. So I, I've I've gone through some some uh, you know steps in the world which make me feel that it is possible to create change. You know, and but more than also the films, I just think that directly. You know teaching, you know, teaching or passing on or mentoring or creating connections between kids in, you know, Tanzania and kids in Colombia uh, to make a feature film that can work. Those are the palpable ways that Maisha now, the school we have in its ninth year, really does it, you know. So I don't think change can be restricted to a medium of art only. Mm -hmm. You know, one has to live it, I think. Um, and I try to do that, but sometimes I stumble. <laughs> <laughs> Mira, I wonder if I can um, bring us back to the reluctant fundamentalist for a second. Um, because this is an extraordinary film. You talked about it being a very difficult film um, for you to make, and perhaps it's also a very difficult film to talk about. But this is a film that really forces your viewers to connect to very unlikely worlds. So you're bringing together the world of financial globalization, the religion of profit, and Islamic radicalism in the film. 
And you really suggest in the film that like political religion, market fundamentalism also dehumanizes us, it strips us of our humanity. And so in the movie we see, you know, Chenge as the financial analyst undergoing a transformation. He's strip searched, he's humiliated, and then he's exoticized by his lover, Kate Hudson. And then when he finally goes home to Lahore, he becomes the object of CIA surveillance. But in the film, you reserve your harshest criti uh, criticism for the one-sidedness of American responses, which you call a kind of unknowing or really a deep misunderstanding on both sides. So I wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit about the nature of the political engagement, the politics of empire um, that's at issue for you in the film, what kinds of interventions you really wanted the film to be engaging in. Well, you know, living as much as I have done in this part of the world, almost as much as the subcontinent, uh, it, it, since 9-11, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the silence and then the skewered spin consistently, you know, around where I am mm -hmm. and the, the absolute lack of exposure, forget about understanding, because it's only when you see that you can understand, is, is, is marked. And I mm -hmm. began to feel a great frustration with not only the way some of us and many of us were seen and suddenly the other, even in a city like New York, which is so much home for so many of us from different places, not only was that happening, but um, we were also getting flooded with a lot of patriotic you know, films uh, that were about Americans returning home in body bags, uh, you know, mm -hmm. after fighting for freedom somewhere where we never saw the place. I mean, we saw the place, but we could never identify it. We never understood even where the drones or the bombs landed. We never, uh, there was not even a character that was named in any of these 12 films that were supposedly about the Iraq mm -hmm. or Afghanistan mm -hmm. war. And that is, you know, that's hard to take. And also when you know there is much more than that, you know, and so, I, I, the mantra of our school is if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will. And, you know, you, I have to practice that and I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But it was really the inspiration from the film not, didn't come only from this, but it, it actually honestly came from my first invitation to Lahore in 2004. And I was just knocked <coughs> out by the embrace, by the familiarity of a very old culture that was mine. You know, my father came from Lahore mm -hmm. and raised us in modern India after partition as Lahori's almost. And I hadn't been to this country that uh, this, this just felt so familiar and yet was absolutely unseeable or unseen, mm -hmm. not only to an Indian kid, but even in the world, one never knew that that is the culture of a living. Mm -hmm. So that was the first idea. Let me make something contemporary about something we don't know about and about Pakistan. And then came upon Mohsin's novel, which very elegantly poses the questions and the complexity of both these universes. Uh, and fortunately, I had him for, uh, you know, he came on the ride of adapting the film book, which is a very difficult adaptation. Mm -hmm. But it came out of, you know, whole, uh, as uh, Leela, Lila said, you know, uh, holding a mirror, you know, seeing what we don't know and then hoping to show what you can recognize yourself in, even though it might be some, a place that you have dismissed or been told to dismiss because it is X, Y or Z, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's where it, it came from and I, and I think that if you, when you see yourself in the other, when you, when you, understand that, that really Chengiz, I mean, you, you look at a Pakistani on Wall Street, you'd never think that his father is a poet who c couldn't stand uh, money, really doesn't have any use for it and can't understand why he's in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the complexity of life. That is our culture as well. You know, so I, I am intrigued by those, that, mm -hmm. that world mm -hmm. and many worlds that come up, spin off it. Mm -hmm. But we've rarely seen a, a coming of age story of a brown man through this very globalized interconnected universe. And I wanted to make a film about our young, you know, about us all, but really about for our young. I have a 21 year old and I have many 21 year olds and they, they are engaged in this question, where do we matter? Where will we be heard? Where do we, you know, where will we be heard? Mm -hmm. What is the truth that's given mm -hmm. to us? Mm -hmm. And these are the questions that are at the heart of reluctant and I hope that mm -hmm. they strike chords. If, if I could just follow up on, on what you've um, said, I, I wonder if you also see a shift coming also back to Mabel's question about your filmic practice, whether you see a shift in this film, um, not only in the subject matter, but also you've got a focus on a male character, Chengiz, which is very different from your previous films. So is this film, and you talk about the film as a thriller, 
Um, so is the film, uh, you know, is this affecting a kind of shift in your filmic practice? Uh, where no, do you I just like this, to not uh, do things that I know how to do. So I just uh, <laughs> jump in and, and hope I can do it, you know. Seriously, I mean, because it is such an obsessive and strangely mm -hmm. difficult and a, a great sacrifice that you make a film mm -hmm. that I have to have the adrenaline to be, be in that world for... This one took five years, usually it takes two, you know. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that was the... that was. That was also the question, could I do something that was um, like on this tightrope of ambiguity, you know, that you see this film and you wonder, is Chinggis, is he or isn't he, was the question, you know. And it's a sort of, uh, it's a real uh, form to learn, you know, while pra doing, you know. And that was what I aspired with a great team of filmmakers, you know. Um, I, I think of it as a human thriller, not so much a bang bang CIA thriller, although we've got that too. <laughs> got that too. But uh, but more like how does a man or a young man find, um, you know, how do we see the young man and who, how, do we understand this man, you know, or, and how does he see himself? In that sense, an uncovering of of layers, uh, and not sometimes a cover, and sometimes a covering, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, it is complicated, you know. The, these worlds that we, bo we belong in and yet when we leave one for the other there is a sense of, um, a cease, you know, of, of discomfort and then you fit into it and then you, you know, it's very, I've, I live mm -hmm. in that world so it's very interesting to try and capture, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually want to, I think I'm going to skip to my last question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Well, because I think it's related to sort of what Anu um, was talking about within the reluctant fundamentals being a departure from what you do, but also mm -hmm. there's some, there was something that I thought was really amazing about the film that had to do with the scene that always pivots in the film where they're actually having the meal. This is Bobby and Changa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that brought me back to this kind of question of everyday life in the domestic sphere that seems to mm -hmm. be very central, I think, to to your storytelling and what you actually show. And, and what I thought was amazing about Cengiz is you get the sense when he's in New York, he's alienated. His home is not his home. Mm -hmm. He's always somewhere else. And his home, yes, is in Lahore. I mean, that's where his family is. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, within the films, like what, what is the role um, of the domestic sphere? And why does that become so fundamental to the telling of the stories, I think, throughout so many of your films? Um. Because the domestic sphere is also a place where you can remove the mm -hmm. layers that you present yourself in the world with. There's a scene, uh, it was the first shot we ever did in Monsoon Wedding, where Dube, the tent man who loves all the gadgets, uh, has been rejected by his beloved Alice, and he comes home so dejected, and it's in one shot where he literally removes every single piece of scarf and cravat and shoes and he literally renders himself in his underwear and mm. weeps, you know. And uh, th that is what I, also, you know, that is mm. the well, domestic sphere where people um, reveal who they really are yeah. uh, mm. and, and um, where couples uh, negotiate, you know, a world that they would not want you to see. You know, also the whole notion of language, mm -hmm. you know, and namesake. Mm -hmm. Uh, they would have to speak Bengali in the in the in the kitchen. You know, they would. I hate those movies that pander to thinking of the audience first and not giving you a subtitled experience and making you hear in a language that mm -hmm. they would never speak in that place. You know, um, and also by the same token to speak in the way we also speak, which is sometimes many languages in one sentence. Mm -hmm. um, I love I love to. Uh, coming from, I think, documentary and coming from a place where uh, it's really ordinary life is fairly extraordinary, mm -hmm. I I'll, my, I, my first salute is to that, you yeah. know, not to um, making an artificial universe. Maybe another kind of movie would need that, but mm -hmm. I, I kind of gravitate to um, places where we can really uh, show both a public space and a private uh, face, mm -hmm. you know. And, and treat both with a kind of delicacy that would reveal, uh, I think, uh, you know, s reveal the universal, I mm -hmm. think, because that's what it does. Um, mm -hmm. And private spaces can be brutal as well, and uh, I can't stand coquetry yeah. of any kind, so I go mm -hmm. into that part of it, uh, whether it be in a, you know, positively in a love situation or even in a uh, revenge situation with that type of... Uh, I don't know, with that type of kind of uh, directness, you know. Um, so it's, it's really comes from 
trying to capture that that yeah. I see in life, uh, but heighten it sometimes for the films. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you've talked about the domestic being a space of intimacy, but also a very difficult place. And I'm really struck by the fact that in uh, many of your early films, and I'm so thrilled we got the clips of some of our um, great favorites um, in that three-minute clip that we saw, but uh, in your films, uh, no one really gets off scot-free, right? You implicate us all, you demand a sort of difficult responsibility from your viewers. And I think of you as someone who's been deeply courageous in taking on sensitive taboo topics uh, that involve gender and culture from prostitution in Salam Bombay to widowhood, and then of course those scenes of child abuse or the memories thereof in, in Monsoon Wedding. Um, and your films, of course, always have strong female characters. Um, so I'm wondering how you negotiate uh, this slippery terrain between stereotypes on the one hand that we have about gender violence in non-Western societies, um, we're saturated by this in our media space, um, but how do you balance that and responding to that with something more complex and more critical? Um, so how do you balance this with the need for internal criticism and for shining a light on the precariousness and vulnerability of women's lives uh, without making them into victims? And so you're constantly straddling, it seems to me, this very difficult uh, middle path, as it were, um, sort of trying to avoid both of these uh, these hazards. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about that. Well, the people you know who attract me, the stories that mm. compel me to to live with for for sometimes years and definitely months at a time, are stories of those who are considered marginal by by, by some part of society. Mm -hmm. And I've always had this terrible fire about who considers who is marginal you know it's like mm -hmm. i want to ask that question you know and that is the it happened with 1980 in 1985 with india cabaret where yeah. you know i told my parents i i want to make a film with these uh, this in this particular cabaret house in in Kartkopar and mm -hmm. and they just like disowned me for six months. I was suddenly vanished. You know, Mira didn't exist. Seriously, mm -hmm. and um, and even I, you know, sitting there in a tenement with with mm -hmm. uh, three women who worked till three o'clock. I lived with them. I used to be considered a stripper. Everyone would give you know all the neighbors would talk when we came back home. And it was very. It mm -hmm. was not the most pleasant of lives. But it's the only way to understand the kind of regular double standards that mm -hmm. women are facing or mm -hmm. you know and live with and and how they counter it which is amazing you know with humor and straightforwardness and the kind of body acceptance of what they do and why they do it mm -hmm. you know and 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 that inspires me seriously mm -hmm. and so you take the kind of uh, strange universe uh, of living in what they called Antofi. I thought, what is Antofi? It turned out to be Antop, Antop Hill, Hill yes. you know, and, and, and uh, you know, for months at an end. And then you get, you know, then they, tr they trust you, they have to, you know, want you in there. And then slowly you bring a camera into it and make a film kind of unabashedly with them about these struggles. Mm -hmm. And that's what has inspired me to show, uh, in, in India Cabaret, it's a triangle. Rekha and Rosie, these women, a male customer who comes often to the club to see them, and his wife, we sort of convinced him to take me home with him, mm -hmm. you know, and then I lived in his house for six weeks, uh, you know, because alcohol was my best friend on that movie and everyone was drunk, and so they sort of said <laughs> yes to things. And, and, and then, uh, you know, got pretty close with his wife, who, who, when you hear of her respectability and her confinement, literally, yeah. You wonder really who is free, you mm -hmm. know. So that has always been the the question uh, that mm -hmm. I have asked. Uh, I w I want to know because I have a healthy, you know, rebellion towards anything mm -hmm. that is authoritative, and and then uh, that judge that judges, you know. I don't. I question that. Who mm -hmm. is the one to judge? And it happened with the street kids. The street kids are just so much uh, really teachers of how to live and how to make a lot out of having nothing, you know, mm -hmm. and never to pity, you know. And, and that's what and that's what really gets me. And so it's versions of that really that I'm still leaning towards in the choices of mm -hmm. of films. Um, but uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, not sort of victims per se, I, I, I like the, the mm -hmm. human being who rails against that. Um, and, uh, and that is a story that I find, you know, that is inspiring to me. Um, so I just want to maybe return to the sort of theme of the global landscape and, 
and this is more a personal story, but I remember in, in the summer of 1991 seeing Mississippi Masala um, when it came out. Actually, not that far. It was either at the 104th or the 84th Street Cinema on Broadway. Um, and I, I remember um, being enthralled by the narratives of home in a way that you actually tell in, in, in the film, and the politics, and how that meets with the politics of working class life that's actually mm -hmm. vivified in this, this town in Mississippi. Um, and the film challenged me actually to think very differently about, um, about family and honor and friendships and loyalty, and also how cross-cultural um, exchanges can also splinter prejudices into like a million afterthoughts mm -hmm. in a way. And, and I thought that was amazing. And I think the statement that Jay, which is the, the main character, utters while, 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 when he has to actually leave his home is that Uganda is my home. He's going mm -hmm. from Kampala to Mississippi. And it, it prompted me to actually rethink my own preconceptions about who is within the African diaspora, for mm -hmm. example. And I thought that was a really powerful moment, if for, certainly for me, uh, in my own, my own understanding mm -hmm. of, of, of my worldview. Um, and I think so many of your films, Reluctant Fundament is exactly one of them, um, uh, track the trajectories of displacements and, and migrations, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. returns, because that's also significant in Mississippi Masala. Jay, Jay goes home at, mm -hmm. at the end of the film. Um, and in those, we witness the collisions of class and, and race. Um, and politics. And so can you talk about how and why so many of your films deal with life in the wakes of these global migrations? Mm -hmm. This is exactly the people that are moving around the world, I think, that, that Lila spoke about. And you really sense that in The Reluctant Fundamentalist mm -hmm. about the movement of people back and forth mm -hmm. um, and what happens in that, mm -hmm. in that space. Well, you know, I, uh, I came here at the age of 18 or 19 with full intention to uh, not to remain here, you know, I never thought of myself mm. as an immigrant or, uh, you know, I just, uh, but yet, slowly, the, my world became one that really actively straddled the two worlds, you know, if I lived in New York, I was making films about strippers in, in India or, uh, you know, an immigrant, a subway, my first subject was the guy who ran the subway newsstand at 116th Street, the same <laughs> subway stop, uh, and I've spent a year filming him. And then his wife had a child back in Ahmedabad, and we followed him home to Ahmedabad and, and discovered that he would only speak to my camera and not to his wife, whom he considered a peasant, and he was now an American fellow. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and uh, so I always somehow, without thinking about it honestly, but because I think I inhabited that world of thinking I was not somewhere else, I was here, mm -hmm. but, but really uh, rooted in another place, I was drawn to those stories of how do we negotiate, you know, uh, this seesaw, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and these stories, as we have seen, I remember there was an amazing book by Jane Kramer called uh, Unsettling Europe. Uh, which was about exactly this, you know, uh, an Algerian family somewhere else, a uh, uh, Ugandan Asian family in London, you know. And it really, um, that was my first, I mean, it really moved me to, to tell these stories because I was connecting with them, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. But the minute you start, I mean, I had never been to the continent of Africa when I went to Uganda to mm -hmm. understand where they had mm -hmm. left it. Mm -hmm. It was eight, 1989, right after the war. And, and, um, you know, it was, uh, I had no idea of the Gemini Patel world, of the Ugandan Asian world. And yeah. look at my world now, I've lived in Uganda for 23 <laughs> years. You know, I suddenly became part of that world in a very intimate way. And, and so, uh, you know, these stories of interconnections have become more and more complicated, like in the case of Chinggis, and more and more normal. Yeah. Uh, one of every person in any upper middle class Indian family, or even middle class Indian family, is somewhere else. Yeah. And so this world is a very real one, a palpable one, a fertile one, but also one is, that is not often seen. And when it is seen, it is pretty reductive. Yeah. It's not usually uh, in its glory, you know, of, of uh, everything that, is, that, that we do, you know. Mm -hmm. So I feel, um, you know, excited to go into that, that world because I, I think I understand it and uh, I feel it and I know what it's like. And there's something about cinema that is almost more potent than literature where you can look out your window, in, you know, on Riverside Drive and see your garden in Kampala, you know. And you can show that in a movie almost more powerfully than in, uh, you know, writing sometimes. 
So it's both those things. But yeah. now, now you know, I go with life, and 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 now uh, that our son is in college, and uh, you know, I'm back to my own ways. I I feel like I can. I hit the streets, uh, you know, harder with reluctant <laughs> fundamentalist, and I'm doing the streets again uh, in the future. So it's less uh, contained because often I made movies because they worked with my life. Like mm -hmm. Monsoon Wedding was made in the summer, but, and people say, "Oh, do you love Monsoon?" I saw all this metaphor for rain and water in your film, and I say, "No, it's my son's school vacation, and he could be with me, <laughs> and it just happened to be Monsoon." So, and we, you know, we filmed the rain. Uh, mm -hmm. So. That was so. You know, now now I can define my calendar and do these things. But originally, it it comes. My work comes from a reflection of what I'm going through. You know, so often like monsoon wedding or namesake. These are worlds of the family universe, of the domestic universe, which um, which I was steeped in, and now I'm. As I said before, <laughs> hitting the streets. <laughs> so maybe we'll end with a quick question about the streets and then open up yes, yes, um, to please. the audience. So I did want to, speaking about space and, and movement, um, I'm really struck by how much cities and urban spaces um, are a part of your, their characters in your films almost, beginning with Bombay, but you know, of course Delhi and New York and now Lahore. Um, Calcutta. So the city, Calcutta. So, you know, the city is a place of danger, of edgy interactions, um, but also of vibrant street life and culture. So this is really a space of chance encounters and for things to happen that are unexpected. And hidden things, hidden yes. places, yes. you know, and layers. So that, can you yeah. say a little bit about these, these um, urban characters um, that, are, that are really sort of viscerally present? In your film. Well, again, in hindsight, you know, I am attracted to the ensemble. I, know, mm -hmm. I don't see the world as a hero and a heroine walking off mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. quiet. I never came from that. You know, I came from this circus life like <laughs> atmosphere, seriously. And I guess the movies are a reflection of that, but also the cities where I have come from and I know mm -hmm. are extraordinarily uh, rich and unexpected. And mm -hmm. also, I have lived in all these cities for huge periods of my life. So it's also knowing them from within mm -hmm. in some ways. And like when I was making The Namesake, when I discovered visually the parallels between Calcutta and New York City in the bridges, in the metal, mm -hmm. in the work, in the wrought iron, in the, but especially the bridges, yes. it, it made me understand how to make this film that you don't quite know which city you're in. You know, it's not about a harsh cut to the third world or anything like that. It's about very similar spaces because both cities have similar spirits of being devoted to politics and art and to graffiti and to, you know, expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love all that visually. You know, it gives me a lot of help. You know, it, it actually not just help, it guides me mm -hmm. in how to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And so, so it pleases me actually deeply when people say that Monsoon Wedding captures the Delhi, you know, spirit, or Salam Bombay really is, we just celebrated its 25th year anniversary this year in India, and uh, it's a changed Bombay now. This would be a deep period film, you know, because it's a, just a different world there. So this becomes something that captures a place that, uh, you know, I mean, you really do get good drugs in that cemetery. People ask me, how do you know to shoot there? I said, you know, I mean, you know, we know these things. So uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a very authentic portrait of where things go on, mm -hmm. from Kamatipura, the red light area, mm -hmm. to where they sleep, to where they go scoring, whatever it is. This is exactly what street kids did in the 80s, you know. So it's, uh, I, get, I get really excited by authenticity. I mean, my friend Misha Shafi in, in Lahore calls me an authenticity junkie. And that's pretty accurate. Because I'm, uh, because nothing teaches me more than the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us. But I think well, there are lots of people you. here who want to have a chance to engage you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe there, there yeah. are microphones out there. So it'd be great mm -hmm. if you'd give a moment where the microphone can get to you. Hi, thank you. No yeah. Um, so personally, I'm also an authenticity junkie. Like Excellent. when you said that. <laughs> Your, uh, Salam Bombay was unbelievable. It was so so good. And uh, <laughs> and the thing is, <laughs> uh, you call it cinema verite. I mean. Whatever you want to call it, City of God had a little bit of it, maybe. I don't know if people saw that. Sure. Um, 
they used actual favela kids. They used, you know, just like you used, you know, they didn't use actors. I know. And yeah, you, oh yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, As they say, what's the question, sir? <laughs> are we going to see more of Cinema Verite? Like, you moved away from it. Like, mm. are we going to see more of it? You said you're going to hit the streets harder now. You're more settled. Mm. Are we going to, like, you, you said you come from documentary filmmaking. Uh, you yeah. know, then we see Kiefer Sutherland. I know. Well, <laughs> you know, th that's just a little piece of it to sell it, I think. Yeah. But uh, there's more than Kiefer in the in the film, and he's actually extraordinary because You're his wrong. jungle is the Wall Street jungle in the movie. Anyhow, but um, yeah, I, I am making a film now called Bengali. Well, two, both films are on the streets. Uh, one is uh, called Bengali Detective. It's a it's a Actually, it's a feature film of a documentary of a pot-bellied, middle-aged uh, Calcutta detective who has a private investigation agency um, in today's Calcutta and how he is committed to cleaning up the corruption of India, kind of, not single-handedly, but in his own modest way, but how he sustains his self, himself with his great love of Bollywood dancing. So, <laughs> I just thought after five years on those kind of streets, I, I, I deserved a little fun. And uh, Calcutta is an extraordinary, again, it's a portrait of a city that, mm. that, that is full of hidden, uh, you know, and great delights as well. So, and then the other film, I, I've been longing and looking for a film to shoot in East Africa, where I live. Uh, and finally, I have one called The Queen of Katwe. It's also a true, true story about an eight-year-old girl in the worst slum of uh, Kampala who sells corn and was taught how to play chess with uh, used bottle caps and became uh, uh, basically a chess prodigy. She's uh, the Ugandan female chess champion and now is on her way to becoming a grandmaster but cannot read or write and is just about 14 now and going to school. So um, it's like Salam Bombay in the sense that her family is, it's unbelievable how one pa person takes one path and the other takes another, you know, and it's a portrait of living uh, in the most um, resourceful and meager way that you can imagine and yet having this unbelievable, you know, kind of brain and ruthless, you know, extraordinary life and a very modest one at the same time. So, yeah, both these films are portraits of life, uh, one more fanciful than the other. But, uh, yeah, so I hope you'll get the grit when you see them. Uh, but on the other hand, just to balance um, my, uh, my the, the grit, is I've been spending about almost six years, and we're almost there, making a very spectacular Broadway musical version of Monsoon Wedding, which is about uh, a few months away. Uh, and uh, it's uh, completely the reverse, where you take the bones of a film that is really music in its center of it and make it back to the theater that I came from in a very mm -hmm. sort of spectacle, you know, spectacular way. So life is rich at the moment, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's only the, the, the streets that, that can make the spectacle be sweet. You know, without one, the other mm -hmm. does not flourish. Yeah. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk with us today. Uh, my question is about the reluctant fundamentalist. In the last half hour of the film, uh, Bobby and Chinguez end up um, spending very intense uh, time in discussion together. And um, in the final scene, uh, it's a decision that Bobby makes. Um, Don't give it away, man. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> let them pay. In case someone else is here. Come on. Okay, I'll get it. So, why does Bobby smirk at the end when he's listening to oh the. My God. <laughs> I just don't I'm not thing, answering right? that question. <laughs> I want your money's worth, then we can talk. <laughs> One more. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was you don't need a microphone. Okay. Um, I had. Uh, I was just curious. Um, have you ever been accused of, of poverty tourism and what your take on that whole debate is? And the second thing, which was based on your response to him, how soon is this Broadway musical going to be released? Because I'm only here to May. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, the Broadway musical will take at least another year because the way it works is we try out in other places and then we bring it here. So it's a long, longer process than films are. So at least a year, or maybe 2015 spring. It may be the fall of 2014. Um, you know, I haven't been accused of poverty tourism. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad for that because I think it's a load of 
bold really. Uh, I mean, I just, uh, you know, when, when Nargis said that about Satyajit Ray's movies, you know, uh, about the Apu trilogy being really, uh, you know, celebrating the poverty of India, it really outraged me because uh, firstly to not see the film for what it is, but secondly to not look at a, a world that exists uh, around you, you know, is not making it disappear. You have to see it. But it's a question of how one does it that's important. And um, I hope, you know, I do it in a way that invites you in and yet um, certainly doesn't, you know, celebrate or exoticize. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I have the mic over here. <laughs> I, own the, I own the mic. Oh, yes. <laughs> But th thank you for sharing your work with us. Uh, the next time I, I go to the library, I'll have a large selection of movies to choose from. Uh, but the point was made that there are very few women in the movie uh, industry. Can you share with us um, and mm -hmm. tell us uh, how difficult is it today for women to break into the movie industry? And do, do you consider yourself a trailblazer for women who come after you? Um, you know, it is a, it's, it's a very difficult profession just for men and women, but certainly for women, like Mabel said, you know, it's about a lot of money and it's, I always think it's like, you have to have the confidence to really convince, you know, a whole array of people that you have to create a world which, you know, this is your movie, you know. And that, con that conning, in a sense, the confidence you have to have, has to be consistent, you know, from a money person to the actor that you want to have be as transparent as possible at that moment. So, um, I think of me, my, you know, my work as a director is to make everyone bloom around me while not, you know, while showing them away, but really letting them go as far as they possibly can within the vision that I hope to explain to them. Um, it is really difficult, I think, but, uh, but I don't uh, allow myself to think, uh, I never do about whether I'm a woman and therefore it's so difficult. I just sort of get on with it, you know. Um, but also I think it's more difficult depending on the path you take. You know, I came to films uh, really to exorcise and exercise th this point of view that we've spoken of, say, the documentary life of worlds that you wouldn't know, worlds where I could be let in, but perhaps you couldn't. You know, the big thing about working with strippers, let's say, is they won't let a man in. You know, I would live there for six months, and that was my cachet. You know, that's, I'll, sh I'll enter a world that you won't be able to, you know. So I was always drawn to making stories that were where I could gain access. And then that created, a, I guess, a sensibility and, and people wanting to see those things, which is, uh, still surprises me that I have a audience, but you know, the, the, an audience builds you know, in, uh, for your world. And there's a saying in India, which I always subscribe by, it's like, dhobi ka kutta na ghar ka na ghat ka, which means I feel like a washerman's dog sometimes without a home or a street, but at home everywhere, you know. And you feel confused in that uh, zone. Like when I made documentaries, uh, you know, I would go around with Greyhound, on the Greyhound bus with all my films under my arm to any union, any women's group, any university that wanted to show these films. But sometimes I would confront people who had no idea idea about India and you know ladies who would say I saw running water in your movie and you have running water in India and I'd feel like crap you know because I'd say who's my you know who am I talking to who is my audience uh, in India I was a novelty because no one made documentary films so you have to find your way and I'm, it's a long 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 answer to your question but there is I'm coming to it um, <laughs> which is that you have, you find your way in in what becomes then your world despite the loneliness of it and despite the confusion and sometimes the, well, the loneliness of it. But stamina is vital and then I just keep going, right? And then people come to me with, you know, you made Salam Bombay, so can you make Perez Family or Vanity Fair or, you know, all kinds of, you know, people want to see that language sometimes. And then I traverse that world. But if I set out to go to Hollywood and say, I want to be on that A-list, you know, from the age of 21, I would be not firstly not sitting in Columbia legally right now. I would uh, I would be you know probably quite unknown as a hack director who was set making rom coms because that's all they'll give the chicks you know. So that's a different worldview, and I, I'd rather my route has been to make my own kind of movies and then have them come to me to try and make something that they hope will be interesting. Um, but 
so that's that's the route. So it depends on what you want to do, where it gets more difficult or less difficult. Because in many ways, um, you know, when I was making a big movie with Johnny Depp and da da da, it was the boys' club. It was the boys' club for 15 months, and it wasn't so happy making, you know. But you have to have the stomach for it because the the larger story you want to tell. But now I think there's such a furore about how few women directors there are that there's a lot more solidarity amongst you know people in the media to really create these opportunities because it is uncanny that in America there are fewer women directors than there are in India, for instance. You know, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but it's absolutely true because there I think we have grown up with women commanding countries you know and we it's not a myth that it's it can ha you know and so you feel like anything is possible but you still have to it depends on the route you take i'd say the same thing you know so it's like that i'm i'm seeing hand gestures so i'm moving on yes 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 sir No, sir, I don't agree, but I, uh, I, I think it's a question of the film, that you're, the story that you're setting out to tell. And I really think that filmmakers have their vocabulary, but I have, um, you know, I think that there are different vocabularies for each one of us. And um, I think that it's sort of short-sighted to, to say that all the work is poignant, you know, if you saw a film of mine called Hysterical Blindness, it's, it's, it's not poignant at all. It's, it's deeply disturbing and quite brutal about the lovelessness in, in our society, you know. So it depends on what you, I think, see and what the theme commands, you know. Um, but I think that uh, just, you know, anyway, I just, I'm not a subscriber to schmaltz in any direction at all. And it sounded like what you were describing as women filmmakers is, you know, schmaltz capital of the world. And that's, I don't belong in it. <laughs> yeah. The film you haven't made that you're dying to make. Oh. Um, the film I haven't made that I'm dying to make. Uh, you know, I... Uh, to really honestly live live in fully in the now, and I'd, if I was dying to make anything, I would be making it, you know. The, uh, and um, I really, the things I choose to do, I, I do very, very fully, and, um, and uh, that's really what I'm doing, which is in the films and the play that I'm describing. So th if, you, if you do anything with the idea of it being a stepping stone to something else, you're screwed, I think, because, uh, uh, because it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, you know, it's only at its fullest does it show you the way, you know? And so I'm really not into, I, I'm into doing what I absolutely die to do. And, um, a lot of the balance, actually, it's, it's, I love the architecture uh, invitation uh, in which I am called a gardener uh, because that is a big source of balance for me because rhythm of nature and nature itself because it has its own rules and it has so much learning one has to have about it, about nature, uh, gives me the uh, cushion, it gives me the buffer really to deal with the extreme, extreme conditions of making films, you know, and people and the volatile nature of the business and then you can make it and you can love it and then you get a lousy distributor and five people see it, you know. It's a lot of uh, ups and downs that can consistently, you know, chase you. But somehow something about um, uh, making gardens and I, I, I plant, you know, guerrilla planting like on, on streets in Kampala, we just uh, plant trees and, and just seeing that and working part of that and the school is a part of that, you know, is, is, is absolutely a part of that, you know, and uh, that makes it, uh, makes the balance p possible, you know, with the, the pain and the pleasure of it. Mm -hmm. Last so question? One more, one more question. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir, ma'am, that's fine. 
I'm going to sneak in two questions, one, uh, one a practical and one a philosophical. Um, the practical one is about executive producers and the way you've funded your films, because I think one of the questions was about capital barriers for women, and I wondered if you could describe how earlier in your career, before people threw projects at you, uh, you managed to cultivate the people who raised the money for your projects. That's number one. And number two is, I, I'm not familiar with every movie you've made, but it seems to me that you're one of the classic people of uh, developing the theme of personal is political. And yet you are, I think, very political in what you've chosen to do in your life. And I'm wondering, have you considered making a film about marginalized social movements, for example, the movement to prevent the war in Iraq before it happened and how millions mobilized and it didn't happen, or the movement of the Egyptian people to change their world, and, and how, how those things happen. Have you considered making a film about a social movement? Mm -hmm. um, the first question about finance. Um, you know, when I started making film, I, I, without knowing it, I was the producer of my own film, so I had to learn where the money goes and how to spend it, you know, from the documentaries. And that was a very good pragmatic uh, part of your mind to develop because then you are your own producer, even in the first film with Salam Bombay. You know, I had to suddenly raise $850,000 from having raised only 150 for my documentaries before that. And that was overwhelming at that moment. But um, what I did was to go back to the people who had bought my documentaries and they all chipped in portions of money and there were lots of scams and lots of con games as well which I won't bore you but you have to go all the way to you know you literally have to scam people into making your first film with you uh, and and uh, but it's good training not the scamming part but the money and how to uh, you know how to spend the money and what is useful and what can you do without you know and so you don't depend on somebody else to organize it for you. In that sense, it's good training. And then I was lucky in Mississippi Masala to uh, hire a, uh, like a production manager who turned out to be my partner, product producing partner for life, Lydia Pilcher, and she's like, we've worked 23 years together, you know? Mm -hmm. So then you really hand over, we raise the money together, and then she, uh, hand over everything producerial to her while I direct. So that's how I conduct uh, my myself. and. So financing, you've got to learn about. You can't just, it, I would not depend on other people to raise money for you. The phone will never ring. You know, you have to find out whichever way it is. I mean, each film demands a different way of financing. So my way is to build on who supported me in the last work and, you know, go, go from there. Um, the second question, I mean, I like to think of myself as making films on, you know, movements that are, about change or, or protest or a person or a, it is a movement, you know, a person is a movement in many ways too. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to say I'll take on Egypt or I'll take on, you know, uh, Iraq because, um, you know, I feel my whole thing is people from within those societies and from really I will do anything to help that story be told correctly rather than tell it myself. Uh, with The Reluctant Fundamentalist, I told it myself because it was about many worlds that were connected to the essential worlds that I have a connection to, you know, in a way. But, uh, so I think people should tell their stories and, and people like me should not tell all of them. Otherwise, I become a Benetton store. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Is that... Uh, Maybe on that note. Yeah. Thank you very much.